Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Netwa, uh, for organizing this meeting, and uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Estelis, uh, for giving me this opportunity to present the uh, clinical burden of electric positive AML uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is the disclaimer of the Estelis, and these are my objectives. Uh, we'll try to talk about uh, the epidemiology of AML. Uh, we'll discuss incidence and prevalence of AML in Saudi Arabia. And uh, we'll talk about the prognostic relevance of uh, some of the key mutation, but with particular focus on flexi mediated AML uh, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, we'll talk about the burden, clinical burden of the flick tree positive AML in Saudi Arabia. And uh, we'll try to emphasize on the need uh, to have flick tree um, inhibitors uh, based therapy available uh, in the country, as this is an unmet medical need uh, to treat uh, a flick tree uh, positive AML in a frontline setting as well as in the relapsed refractory setting, as uh, uh, there is very narrow window of opportunity to treat these kind of relapsed refractory patients, uh, those who have flick tree positive AML. So let's begin with the uh, statistics uh, in the United States. Uh, um, how commonly um, acute myelial leukemia is uh, uh, diagnosed there and uh, the prevalence of uh, acute myelial leukemia in the U.S. Uh, so the rate of the newly diagnosed um, AML cases per 100,000 was 4.3 in 2017, and the death rate was 2.8 per 100,000 in uh, 2017. And the lifetime risk of developing uh, a cancer uh, is about 0.5% of the total population uh, in uh, 2017. And the prevalence of the acute myeloid leukemia in U.S. was uh, uh, about 6, uh, 64,500 cases of acute myeloid leukemia in, in U.S. in 2017. And it is estimated to have uh, around 20,000 newly uh, new cases of uh, AML will be diagnosed in 2020, and the estimated uh, deaths uh, due to AML is approximately 11,200, uh, with a five years relative survival of 28.7%. Now let's move to the cancer. Uh, a registry of Saudi Arabia 2015. This is the latest cancer registry report that we have, and according to that, uh, leukemia is the fifth most common cancer with the total number of cases of around 700 uh, cases of leukemia were diagnosed in 2015. And, and acute myeloid leukemia was the second most common cancer, uh, second most common leukemia uh, with the total number of cases of 130 cases uh, of acute uh, myeloid leukemia were diagnosed in uh, 2015. But then we also have uh, the Global Cancer Observatory report um, uh, for Saudi Arabia, which has shown, uh, that was published in 2018, a couple of years ago, that had shown the total number of leukemia cases were actually more than doubled in three years when you compare it with 2015. In 2015, we had 700 cases of leukemia. In 2018, according to this report, we have 1,500 cases of uh, uh, leukemia, and that means it's more than double. And if we extrapolate this information and try to find out how much uh, is probably estimated uh, number of newly diagnosed cases of AML, so uh, we're talking about at least uh, uh, 258 cases of uh, AML are expected to be diagnosed in 2018, and probably um, we are close to 300 cases of newly diagnosed AML uh, as of now in 2020. And not only this. Uh, leukemia was fifth most common cancer in 2015 cancer registry, and now it has become fourth most common cancer, according to Global Cancer Observatory report. And uh, based on the cancer registry report that we discussed, the incidence of AML among the Saudi national is about 0.65 to 100,000 uh, persons, and the global prevalence rate of the acute myeloid leukemia is 0.6 to 11 per 100,000. Uh, we don't know yet how much is exactly the prevalence uh, rate of acute myeloid leukemia in Saudi Arabia, but um, I have extensively asked different hematologists, and I personally, uh, uh, I mean, have this assumption that we have around 1,500 to 2,000 cases of acute myeloid leukemia in the country, and the population of the country uh, is 34.8 million as of now, and if we believe this figure is uh, uh, approximately true, so then we are talking about prevalence rate of AML in Saudi population is nearly four to six per hundred thousand. And as we're talking about uh, flick positive AML in Saudi Arabia, and we know from the published literature 
and from the NCC guideline that about 35 to 40 percent of the acute mitral leukemia patients they had uh, they have FLIC3 uh, mutation and the most commonest uh, FLIC3 mutation is FLIC3 IDD mutation which has uh, uh, a significant prognostic relevance as well as it has the uh, predictive biomarker and the Prognostic significance of the FLIC3 TKD is uh, probably still debatable, and we have about 30% of FLIC3 IDD uh, positive AML and 10%, 5 to 10% of the cases of the AML are uh, FLIC3 TKD uh, positive. So the total sum is uh, about, around about 35 to 40% of acute mitral leukemia uh, patients. They have FLIC3 mutation as per NCC and guidelines 2020. If that's true, and we, we assume that we have 1,500 to 2,000 cases of AML, so we're talking about around 600 to 800 cases of FLIC3 positive AML are prevalent in Saudi Arabia uh, right now. And we don't have therapy for these kind of patients as of now. AML is really an aggressive and fatal disease, and its behavior is really aggressive among all the leukemias. And uh, one of the study in UK was published in 2017 had shown that around 32 percent of all the leukemia cases in UK uh, were AML, the, the leukemia, uh, acute mitral leukemia, the second most commonest cancer. 3,152 cases were diagnosed in 2017, and there were 2,598 deaths in 2017 were recorded. Around 25% of the patients with AML are estimated to be refractory to treatment, and more than 50% of the patients with AML are estimated to relapse. As of uh, um, now, uh, the, uh, the um, AML uh, uh, is diagnosed by the WHO statement, and that's pretty clear statement that it has the uh, some blast count consideration, and then the, you do the bone marrow biopsy. And the bone marrow finding should be consistent with AML with the blast count consideration of having blast more than 20% or equal to 20%. And in some situation, uh, no matter what, uh, what percentage of the blast you have in your patient, but if they have the AML defining cytogenetics, such as core binding factors, which is translocation 821, inversion 16, translocation 1616, uh, this is still considered as uh, AML. And also, WHO um, system has replaced the prior French-American British classification of acute myeloid leukemia um, uh, as it was updated in 2016. And now there are five different classes of PMLS for WHO classification. That's a pretty important slide, and it talks about cytogenetic and molecular mutation and their prognostic relevance. And uh, basically, it uh, uh, differentiates ML into three different categories, favorable, intermediate, and adverse risk, and it has more kind of more prognostic significance and relevance. So the patient, those who have favorable risk, they have cytogenetics core binding factors, and uh, coupled with the NPM1 mutation uh, or SEPA double mutation, and they should not have like GID mutation, and that's favorable risk. And these are the patients who are going to receive induction remission therapy followed by consolidation chemotherapy, and they do very well with the chemotherapy, especially the core binding factors they have the best responsiveness uh, uh, prognostic indicator uh, for high-dose uh, cytarabi. But the patients also have adverse risk to basically include the chromosome 5 and 7 abnormalities or complex carrier type for those who have MLL gene rearrangement with Philadelphia, or Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, so basically, these patients are even patients having normal cytogenetics when they have the flip to IDD mutation or other words, uh, uh, mutation, then uh, they are adverse risk mutation and they're adverse risk AML. And these are the patients who are not going to do well with the chemotherapy. So you have to give permission induction therapy. And the best consolidation therapy is the elegant extensive transplantation. And then we have the category of intermediate risk AML. So this is still debatable. The role of the transplant is still debatable. If you are a transplant center, you will definitely do the transplant like we are the transplant center. And if we have any patient with a CKID mutation, for example, uh, with the, uh, even with a co-binding factor or normal cytogenetic with a CKID mutation, we do transplant uh, these kind of patients. And uh, we have uh, many uh, uh, mutations which have uh, prognostic uh, significance. Uh, one of the most important uh, mutations is the uh, FLIC3 mutation, and uh, it really offers poor prognosis in terms of uh, shorter overall survival and shorter disease-free survival, and uh, when they relapse, uh, it's pretty difficult to get them into complete remission, and they have very short overall, overall survival in, in a relapsed refractory state. But it's also a predictive biomarker as, as we have the target therapy for the FLIC3 uh, mutation. And in frontline setting, we have MIDAS and we can combine it with 
uh, with the chemotherapy like 7 plus 3 and, and second line setting and ref relaxed refractory AML. Uh, there is very promising uh, uh, green inhibitor gel creatinine, which uh, has been compared with the salvage chemotherapy, and it has shown significant uh, complete remission and complete remission with incomplete recovery of about 34% in admittal trial when it was compared with the uh, chemotherapy. And it's pretty difficult to get those patients in the lab refractory setting having clinically positive AML to get them into remission and take them on road to the transplant. And Bill Tratton uh, has really made it possible uh, in significant number of patients uh, uh, to, to, to make them to the transplant. NPM1 and CEPA double mutation, they have good prognosis and uh, CKIT mutation has the bad prognosis. This slide really talks about like complexity of the genomic landscape uh, on uh, uh, in AML patients with the flexure mutation is the most commonest mutation. We're talking about 40% of patients in NCCN guideline they have flexure mutation, and uh, and around 30% of patients they have flexure IDD, and five to 10% of patients they have flexure TKD mutation. And this is prognostic as well as the predictive biomarkers. And uh, other predictive biomarkers are IDH1 and IDH2, as we have the inhibitors uh, of IDH1 and IDH2, and these are all the worst prognosis uh, mutations. So what is FLIC3 gene? FLIC3 gene is really an important gene which is responsible for uh, hematopoiesis. And uh, FLIC3 gene basically uh, provides instruction for making a specific protein called FLIC3 uh, FMS-like uh, uh, tyrosine uh, kinase, um, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, which is expressed on the CD34 uh, cells of the pluripotent stem, uh, stem cells. And that's responsible for survival, proliferation, and differentiation of uh, the uh, pluripotent stem cells into the different types of the blood cells. And when this mutation occurs, then uh, this, uh, there is a disruption of the survival and uh, proliferation and uh, differentiation of the pluripotent stem cells into different lines of the blood cells, and leukemogenesis happens. And that's pretty difficult to treat this kind of AML. And for that, we really need to have specific target therapy incorporated into chemotherapy or used as monotherapy in relapsed refractory setting. So there are two types of mutation. There is flip tree IDT mutation, uh, which is uh, found here is internal tandem duplication, and that's really associated with the worst prognosis. And then we have the flip tree TKD mutation. The earlier studies uh, published almost uh, 20 years ago, one of the studies published in Blood 2002, uh, had shown the prognostic relevance of flip 3 mutation with overall survival. And when they looked at the prognostic relevance, they found out that those patients who had flip 3 mutation, they had very shorter overall survival in comparison to those patients who had no flip 3 mutation. And then we had the flip 3 the A35 mutation, which is now recognized as TKD mutation, it has a slightly better overall survival in comparison to ITD, but it has inferior survival in comparison to no flick through IDD mutation. This uh, flick through mutation is really a marker of very poor prognosis in terms of uh, shorter disease free survival. The risk of relapse is very high, and they have shorter overall survival. And even in relapse, I think there's another study which was published in the Kenya research 10 years ago. Uh, they, they looked at uh, uh, overall survival, prognostic relevance, and they, they found out that those patients who had uh, flick free mutation, they had very short overall survival when the patient had first relapse uh, flick three positive AML patient when they had a first relapse in comparison to those patients who do not have flick three mutation. Not only this, it's very difficult to get these patients to complete remission. But uh, now we have a randomized control trial, admittal trial, which we were talking about, had shown that around 34% of patients uh, um, uh, use of the kiltratinib in relapsed refractory setting, 34% of the patients uh, um, uh, were able to achieve complete remission and complete remission and were incomplete recovery and they were uh, able to be transplanted. And then you can use kiltratinib in post transplant setting. So these are the examples of the predictive biomarkers uh, for FLIC3. We have uh, mitostatin in frontline setting. You can incorporate it with 7 plus 3 induction therapy and then with the consolidation therapy, and then you can uh, use it post-transplant 
or one year or until the disease progression. And similarly, you can use Giltratinib. I think because of the Saudi FDA regulation, Estilis does not want to uh, show the name of the drug here, but I would like to say the, that Giltratinib is a very promising drug in relapse of refrigerator. Then we have Ivocinib and Inacinib in IDH1 and IDH2 positive mutation in frontline as well as in second line setting. And uh, Gemtuzumab or Zogomycin can be used in CD3 positive PML patients. So that's the trial in 7 plus 3. And they looked at the median overall survival and they found significantly improved overall survival was 75 months versus 24 months in patients those who did not receive the mitostatin in the frontline setting. So that really tells you the significance of using plus 3 inhibitor in uh, frontline as well as uh, in a uh, second line setting. So the relapse and refractory flictory positive AML is really a big dilemma as there is nothing that we can offer to these patients in our uh, country. Salivary therapy is typically administered and allergenic stem cell transplantation is the only curative option. But in order for the patient to be fit for the transplant, they have to be in complete remission or at least complete remission within complete recovery, or at least complete remission with uh, partial hematological recovery. Uh, tomorrow in my presentation, I will talk about in details about that trial as well as all the definitions of the response rates. Uh, but the current standard of care in the country in Saudi Arabia is the cell waste chemotherapy flag, IDA flag, MAC, all of you guys are using it, hypermethylating agents, but it's uh, associated with very inferior outcome. So, um, I mean, uh, in comparison to that middle trial data, so that's really uh, tells us that there's an unmet medical need to have flictory inhibitors in relapse refractory setting uh, with a flictory positive uh, uh, AML, and there is very small window of uh, opportunity with these kind of patients. So that has the take home message that uh, flick tree uh, positive AML patients are associated with very poor outcome and uh, current standard of care in the country is not optimal for flick tree positive AML patients both in frontline as well as in second line setting. And that really tells us that there is an unmet medical need to have flick tree inhibitor in uh, frontline setting as well as uh, particularly in the relapse refractory uh, AML patients uh, because there is very small window of uh, opportunity to treat these kind of patients. With that, I would like to say thank you so much. Thank you.